Good evening and welcome. My name is Terry Eichel, and I'm with the Interreligious Eco-Justice Network. We are a faith-based environmental organization that works with religious communities in Connecticut. Our mission is to inspire and equip Connecticut's religious communities and their spiritual allies to protect our planet through education, engagement, and advocacy. I would first like to read our land acknowledgement statement. We acknowledge that Connecticut, Algonquin for land on the Tidal River, is the traditional home of Mohegans, Pequots, and many other tribes. We are grateful for our native people's care for their home and will strive to preserve it for the next seven generations. IRE Jan works with religious communities on issues like climate change, toxic pollution, and biodiversity loss. This year, our work on climate change has a specific focus on how climate change intersects with other issues of inequity and injustice. Uh, we are focusing on two areas, energy efficiency and food justice in 2023. Tonight's webinar presented by Lynn Fulkerson and moderated by Millie Lagenhausen addresses the issue of how we as faith communities can bring fresh produce to our communities. We have more than 20 houses of worship represented here tonight, as well as several interfaith or justice organizations, which is great. Plus there are a lot of just unaffiliated people who wanna know more about community gardens, which is also awesome. This webinar, like all of our webinars, will be up on our YouTube channel by tomorrow evening, I hope, <laughs> should be. I will also follow, uh, follow up with an email with relevant links. I hope that you join IREJN as an individual and that you encourage your house of worship to join as well. We are stronger together. Lynn will give our presentation, followed by some Q&A with Millie, and then we will open it up for questions from you. If you have questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A. I would now like to introduce Millie Legenhausen to introduce Lynn. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. My name is Millie Legenhausen, and I'm an IREJN board member. This evening, I have the pleasure to introduce you to one of IREJN's founding members and master gardener, Lynn Falkerson. Before we begin the presentation, I would like to read a brief biography. Lynn is a person of many interests, and most revolve around being a good steward of the earth for the benefit of all peoples. Lynn received a master's degree in religious studies from Hartford Seminary in 1993. She went on to work with the Episcopal Diocese of Connecticut to develop an environmental ministry. In 1995, as chair of the newly formed Connecticut Diocesan Committee on the Environment, she focused on raising awareness of the need to care for the gifts of creation. She joined with members of other faith traditions to address eco-justice issues in public policy. Together with Reverend Thomas Carr, she founded the Interreligious Eco-Justice Network, IREJN, and served on the board of directors until 2019. For decades, Lynn has devoted her time to local environmental legislation and protection in her hometown of Litchfield, successfully promoting an ordinance banning the disposal and use of fracking waste. Lynn co-founded the Litchfield Energy Task Force and served as a member of the Litchfield Green Team. She served on the board of the Northwest Conservation District, who awarded her their conservation award in 2017. Lynn is currently a member of the Church of Christ Goshen's Mission 4-1 Earth Ministry. Lynn has established two community gardens in Torrington. Also, her Goshen Green Garden grows organic vegetables that are distributed to the greater community. In 2000, uh, 2019, Lynn and her husband, John, received the Wisdom House Community Service Award. Today, creating pollinator pathway gardens is her current uh, passion and mine too. So if you have been considering starting a community garden but didn't know where to begin, you are in the right place. Lynn's presentation and personal anecdotes will guide you through the process from concept to the point where the gardening begins. Please welcome Lynn Falkerson. 
Thank you very much, Millie. Uh, I appreciate that, very generous. Um, and I want to thank Terry Eichel as well. Um, I've known Terry uh, since before IREJN and, and, um, and we were participating in the Sooty Six campaign in Connecticut together. And Terry, as some of you may know, is an opera singer and she put together a choral group to sing at one of the Sooty Six power plants in Bridgeport. Uh, so we've had um, a long partnership in, in addressing environmental justice issues. Um, I also want to say that um, uh, Terry has been a, a wonderful leader of IRA Jan. Uh, we've seen um, the organization grow under her leadership. And uh, Terry has recently been appointed full-time executive director. So um, Terry, we celebrate that with you and with IRA Jan. I'm going to start uh, sharing my uh, screen now. Here we go. Um, and um, this is the, um, the mission statement of IREJN. Um, and um, many of you have been uh, participating in our programs uh, we're, uh, in the past, and, and we're very excited and delighted that you're joining us tonight uh, to learn about how to create a community garden. Uh, it is also a passion, creating community gardens is a passion of mine, along with the pollinator gardens. Um, both places, uh, you witness miracles all the time. So um, I um, hope I can answer your questions and, and help you in, in the process. Um, this program is also supported by the Master Gardener Program of Yukon. And I want to mention that Millie is also a master gardener. And I, um, I'm so happy she's with us so she can help uh, answer some of your questions as well. Community Garden helps to unite communities. And uh, while we grow food and we make friends and we have fun and we learn to love and care for the earth. Um, and we, we learn how precious, how very precious it is. Okay, there, I think, no? <laughs> My husband's helping me. I'm not very good at this. Um, as Millie mentioned, uh, we'll talk about how you organize uh, for starting a community garden. Um, what we will not cover in this presentation is actual gardening. So we won't. Lynn, you muted yourself. There, okay, okay, <laughs> thank you. You're back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is what kept me awake last night, actually, whether or not I'd actually be able to do this. This is my first webinar that I've done. Um, so what I just said was that um, we will not cover in this section the actual gardening. We won't be talking about soil preparation, planting, maintenance, and composting, and so forth. But I do want to recommend the PowerPoint that was done by Letty Nagels and Charmaine Craig. And you can find that on the uh, IREJN uh, website. Uh, and I think Harry will make all these um, links available after the um, after the webinar. Here we go again. So what is a community garden? It's a place to grow. Um, and many things grow in a community garden. Um, we're growing uh, relationships and friendships and community. Um, we come together um, and uh, to uh, grow. And community gardens can take several forms. They can be urban, suburban, or rural. They can be one large community plot growing for the community, or many individual plots, or both. Who the garden serves will determine 
how your garden is organized. They grow out of the need or desire of the community to have an opportunity to produce food and to connect with the earth. So why do we have a community garden? Well, as I mentioned, community gardens build communities and they build relationships and those relationships last beyond the growing season. Besides, it's fun. You can see these kids are having a great time. Um, it provides an opportunity to work together, to learn from one another. It celebrates diversity. It benefits health, both physical and emotional. It provides fresh and nutritious and diverse foods and it connects us with the natural world, with plants, birds, insects, and soil, and all the miracles that happen there. It also offers us learning opportunities. We learn to grow seeds from, and plants. Um, we learn how to care for the soil and the essential life that's within that soil. We learn about composting. Why do we do it and how do we do it? How do we conserve water and why do we conserve water, a precious resource? Um, and it teaches us about environmental stewardship and caring for the land, sustainable land use. It also offers life skills. So you learn to plan your garden, you learn about organizing, uh, so you might have a plan for, for um, companion plants, uh, you learn about rotating crops, all the those kinds of things, you learn, learn to work with teams. And in and, and some community gardens, you actually learn food preparation. And it creates a healthy and beautiful environment. Here you see some kids um, working in a community garden in an urban setting. And more children <laughs> enjoying the garden. Uh, gardening is cheaper than therapy and you get tomatoes. I love that. So we get, we have fun, we enjoy the sunshine, we make friends, we get lots of exercise, and on top of it all, we get food. Not only lots of tomatoes, but often lots of zucchini. Uh, so first things first, take a measure of the level of support in your community for this project. Engage your community from the beginning. You're, gonna, you're going to hear a lot of that from me, because it's one of the keys to success for your garden. Engage your community from the beginning. And what do I mean by that? First, uh, if, if this is going to be a project of your house of worship, or maybe it's a project of another organization, maybe it is your community center. Perhaps it's your land trust. Um, perhaps it's your garden club, or whatever. You want to engage the leadership of, and the administration of that organization, get their support, get them behind you. From that point, you reach out to the larger community. So the, it may be the larger community of, at your house of worship, maybe it's your town, maybe um, you're engaging other groups to join you. There are lots of examples here in Connecticut of um, groups coming together and building community gardens. So once you've started engaging your, your larger community, um, hold a meeting of all these interested people. So you want to really kind of get a sense of the kind of support you will have. So put together an initiating team. Um, you might, probably will call a, a meeting um, of your um, interested people and at that meeting, um, you can begin to organize a leadership team. Uh, see who's interested in being a coordinator. Maybe you'll have several people who will coordinate and organize your tasks. Um, one of the things you wanna do early on is with, with your leadership team is um, talk about how decisions will be made and how work will be shared. Also, communication with um, the members of your community that are interested in, in the garden is essential. So start making lists of names and contact information. What your mission is for your garden will determine who the garden will serve. It'll also um, decide, it, it will also um, 
give you some goals and objectives to work on. So create a, a mission statement and list your goals and objectives. From there, you can begin to design a garden that will work best for your purposes. So you have to have a sense of direction of where you're going and what you want to do. Here's a sample mission statement. The community garden's mission is to grow fresh organic food to distribute free to local distribution centers that provide for those in need. It's to offer an opportunity to grow fresh organic food to, to members of the community. So this garden is going to not only grow food to give away in the community, but it's also going to offer the opportunity to garden for, for families um, and individuals or organizations. Um, provide educational opportunities to the greater community. Provide support to those who wish to grow food but are in need of assistance. That's going to help frame how you design your garden. If you're going to in, engage people who need assistance in the garden, you'll have to accommodate them in some way. It may mean raised beds, um, uh, benches in the garden for where people can rest and so forth. What kind of community garden? Uh, will it be individual pot plots? Uh, will it be a cooperative team growing for the community? Will it serve youth? Will it serve seniors? Will it be a therapeutic garden addressing social, emotional, psychological, and physical well being? And all of these gardens um, uh, serve important purposes. Um, at the same time, you want to explore the benefits of organic gardening. So once you have your mission statement, you can begin to visualize your, what your garden is going to look like and what you want to happen there. While all these gardens serve as catalysts for bringing people together and improving community, some of them grow food for the gardeners themselves. Some of them donate their produce um, to the hungry and food insecure. Um, food equity is, is a, 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 an area that community gardens serve well. Um, you want to focus on education, skill building, nutrition, health, well-being, and exercise. Uh, some community gardens sell the produce for income. Uh, some simply provide a venue for those who just love to garden. And all communities provide opportunities for neighborhood renewal and beautification. Children love community gardens, but seniors love them too. And I'll have some stories to tell you about that. Um, if the project is meant to benefit a particular group or neighborhood, it's essential that you engage that organization or that group from the beginning. I'm going to give you an example here. Um, I started helped to start two um, community gardens in Torrington, Connecticut. We are fortunate and blessed to have Primetime House in Torrington. Primetime serves people who have mental, mental health issues. They um, strive to help their clients um, become independent. They teach them skills and they also help them to become integrated into the community. They reached out to our church when we were, um, when we received a grant to build a community garden and they re uh, expressed their desire to have a community garden, not only for their clients. Uh, this is a, a day facility. It's not a, a, a residential facility. And, um, and they wanted to also invite the neighbors in. There across the street from uh, the prime time house is a old factory that was repurposed into condominiums. So um, we um, talked about inviting the residents of the condominiums who uh, did not have spaces for gardening to come over to the um, community garden that we developed at prime time house. It was a great success that was about 17 years ago and it's still going strong. But we involved prime time from the very beginning. Uh, they helped us um, to figure out what's the best type of garden for them and how we're going to go about building it to serve their needs. So 
now you have your uh, leadership group. Uh, you've talked about what kind of garden you want to have. Um, name your garden. Make sure you have a mailing address and a central phone number for people to contact you. The next step is to find a site. You may be fortunate, may perhaps your house of worship has plenty of land and it's suitable land. Uh, that, that would be great. Uh, doesn't always happen. Um, sometimes the parking lots take up a lot of land and you really don't want to put uh, a garden next to a parking lot uh, because of runoff. Um, you need to have a minimum of six hours of sunlight a day, um, preferably more. You need to have available clean water. That can sometimes be a big issue and a big expense. Um, you need to check soil, um, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, make sure it's healthy. Uh, you, uh, prefer, uh, it's preferable to have a location where gardeners feel safe. Also, access is important. Uh, if the garden, uh, if the piece of land um, is at the top of a hill, uh, it's probably not going to work too, too well, especially for seniors. So finding a suitable land is essential to success. So if you cannot use the uh, land at your house of worship or at your organization, uh, where can you go to look for a site? Um, we've looked at land trusts and land preserves. Uh, look in your town, uh, see if they have any uh, available land. Their parks and rec department may have some land. Um, community centers often have land. Um, you can also uh, contact uh, farmers and agricultural societies in, in your community and see if they have a little spot for you uh, and it has easy access. Um, garden clubs uh, can help you to find land. Um, you can also partner with another house of worship. Uh, I have an example here in Hartford. Um, the um, Emmanuel Congregational Church in Hartford partnered with the Muhammad Islamic Center of Hartford, and they built a garden at the mosque together. So that's an example of a, of a partnership. There are many other partnerships. Um, the G Judea Garden in Washington, Connecticut, a very interesting garden. Uh, they do an adopt a crop program um, and they partnered with a hundred individual schools, religious groups uh, and businesses to create their garden. Uh, let me say something about adopt a crop. Um, what they did was they built a garden with um, individual plots and they invited organizations and individuals to come in and grow a particular crop for the local food um, pantry. And so for example, uh, the Girl Scouts might grow strawberries, uh, the DAR may grow kale, the Lions Club might, Club might grow leeks, um, the churches might grow root crops. So each um, organization took a plot and grew a particular uh, vegetable. And um, that's, a, that's a great uh, um, uh, idea. And we've tried it in, the, in our garden in Goshen and it works well. We have um, teams. So we have the squash team, the tomato team, the potato team, and the greens team. And each team has a captain. They sign up their volunteers and um, they do everything from preparing the soil to planting the plants, uh, to weeding and to harvesting and delivering. Some ideas for you. Um, so um, you find a piece of land, uh, identify the landowner and see if uh, he or she would be interested in, in uh, allowing you to use a piece of their property, their la land. Um, when you find that, uh, obtain a list of the uses of the land to evaluate potential for contamination. This is very, very important. Um, 
and we I will go into more detail on that. Um, check to see if there's any potential for runoff from a parking lot or a highway. Um, do a soil test to identify the existing nutrient levels and the pH, and, and you want to look at heavy metals too. Um, so if you find lead in the soil, it could indicate other contamination as well, particularly ar uh, arsenic. So when indicated, um, uh, check for petrochemicals and other persistent chemicals. Um, an example um, is a place that uh, perhaps there was an underground oil tank that leaked. Um, my own experience is my husband and I bought a farm um, and I moved uh, to it and, and I wanted to start a garden and I thought next to the barn would be ideal. So we started digging and the soil was black and it had a funny smell. I called uh, a member of the family that we uh, had bought the farm from and found out that um, they, had, they had owned the farm for several generations and they dumped their, um, their oil next to the barn uh, when they were changing the oil on their tractors. So <laughs> that was not a good site for my garden. Um, there were definitely petrochemicals there. Um, other persistent chemicals can come from crops like tobacco, uh, old orchards, and so forth. So um, it's very, very important to, um, to do that. Um, once you've uh, found your land and you have an agreement with the landowner, determine with them who will be responsible for the liability insurance if someone gets hurt um, on the property. Uh, also determine if you have uh, if there are any municipal permits required for the land um, and um, uh, enter into a lease agreement with the landowner once, once those things are settled. Uh, you should enter into an agreement that lasts at least three years. It's a lot of work uh, to build a community garden. You don't want the landowner to change their mind after a year and then you have to start all over again. So, as I said, check the history of usage um, of the land. Uh, soil pollution happens. Um, so, check the crops that were grown. As I mentioned, tobacco. We have had a lot of tobacco fields in Connecticut. A lot of that land cannot be used. Um, poultry farming. There's runoff from uh, poultry farms. Uh, so, check about that. Uh, has there been a, a, a combustion or burn site? on that land. Uh, many farms had um, places where they burned uh, waste. So check to check on that. Uh, dump sites. Um, businesses, uh, sometimes you find petroleum products, particularly um, at, let's say, a gas station. Um, uh, buildings uh, can um, uh, add lead to the soil from the, the paint. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, could uh, be a source of um, uh, petroleum products uh, leakage as well. If the history is not known about the land, you can uh, call the Department of Public Health to see if there's a history of contamination on that site, and they might have some information for you. I've talked to several soil scientists about urban gardens, and what they recommend is covering the soil and building raised beds and filling it with new garden soil. Um, I have been told that most likely um, urban uh, gardens are going to have some kind of some source of contamination. You can do the testing. It's very expensive for petrochemicals and heavy metals, um, but it's much easier just go with a raised bed and uh, many many community gardens in urban settings have done that successfully. In the community there are these resources, the uh, Natural Resources Conservation Services. Um, get to know these folks. Uh, you'll have an office in your county somewhere. Um, they offer soil screening for chemicals and uh, they don't do testing, but they screen. They look for indications of uh, contamination. 
they also offer grants and uh, cost sharing for a lot of um, uh, community gardens. They will uh, help share the cost for raised beds in an urban garden. They also encourage mulching to keep down uh, 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 soil from um, aerializing, uh, especially if the soil could potentially be contaminated. Um, they also um, give grants for a growing, growing uh, grow tunnels if you want to extend the season of your garden. Another source of uh, grants is uh, the New England Grassroots Environmental Fund. They've uh, gr written grants for many, uh, they've given grants to many community gardens in Connecticut. So give them a, a try. Um, the USDA and the uh, Connecticut Conservation Districts are great resources. They also do grant sh uh, grants and cost sharing uh, for local agriculture. So um, there are um, opportunities for um, financial support there as well. Speaking of financial support, um, you, this is, an, uh, a, I would say, the next step. Uh, you need to estimate the cost of your garden. Um, so you've already um, envisioned your garden. You know what you want to do. Uh, look at what you are going to need and develop a budget. I recommend making a wish list and putting it out to your community. Uh, it is amazing um, the support that you can receive from your community. Um, people have um, things that they would like to donate to you. They may have uh, a wheelbarrow or tools or hoses. Uh, they may offer to help you build the garden. So um, make a wish list. Um, you may need fencing uh, to keep the deer and the rabbits and the raccoons out. Uh, fencing is very expensive. Um, you might like to have a shed uh, to, for keeping tools and, and other things that the gardeners will need. Um, you'll have, you'll ha uh, probably have a composting system and um, uh, that's something you can, um, uh, there are several de designs of composting systems and uh, from a, 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 as inexpensive as uh, pallets that you can get for free or you can buy composting systems online and in your local uh, garden store. Determine how you will raise funds. Um, I've mentioned grants and matches and cost sharing. Um, you might think about fundraising in your community. Um, maybe you can have an event that would raise um, money for your community garden. Uh, look for sponsors. Uh, the man you see on the ladder in this um, photograph, uh, he donated that beautiful shed to our garden and actually came over and painted it too. Um, he donated it in memory of his wife who was deceased and was an avid gardener. Um, decide if you want to um, um, have membership dues or fees for your gardeners, which is a, a source of, um, of, of um, resources, but it's minimal. Um, I would say fundraising, grant writing, and sponsors and uh, contributions from your community will get you where you want to go. Here's an example of a shed where there are uh, baskets for individual gardeners. It houses um, nutrients and mulches for the garden and all kinds of tools. Um, you might want to put a message board in your garden in your garden shed uh, to leave message so gardeners can leave messages for one another. Um, you uh, might want to have a, um, a sign-in book for your volunteers, um, especially um, master gardeners get credit for um, working in community gardens and, and need to keep track of it. So um, the shed can be used, uh, is, is very useful. I highly recommend it. Um, other uh, decisions to make. Uh, will your garden be till? or no-till, or will it be a combination? Uh, tilling has become less popular um, uh, because it disrupts the life in the soil. No-till is taking off. 
um, some gardeners and some farmers have been resistant to it, but the results are astounding. Um, so uh, the soil is um, is left in in intact, and you add to the soil. Uh, it doesn't require uh, the soil to be disturbed. So look into the uh, advantages of no-till, I would recommend. Also look into the advantages of organic gardening and decide whether or not that would be something that would be um, required in your garden. Uh, which leads me to rules and guidelines. Uh, I have an example for you. Um, rules and guidelines are very important so gardeners know uh, what is accepted and what is not accepted. Um, it, it, help, it helps save, save a lot of problems. Um, do you want to have an application for gardeners to fill out and do you want to um, uh, ask for membership fees or usage fees? And sign up volunteers. Again, you will need time, talent, and financial support for the garden. And here are some happy volunteers ready, uh, getting ready for the garden and there's still snow on the ground. Looks like today, we're all dreaming of the garden. Engage your local and uh, civic and youth organizations. This is a Boy Scout troop that loves to come to the garden and help us and they have a lot of fun. Uh, the Lions Club also comes and helps, the 4-Hers, uh, master gardeners, as I mentioned, local garden clubs like to get involved. And another organization that you might not have thought of is the Connecticut Alternative Incarceration Program. Uh, let me tell you about that. Uh, this is run by the state of Connecticut um, prison system, and um, it is an opportunity for uh, nonviolent offenders to do community service rather than uh, going to jail. Um, the fence you see in this picture was installed by the local um, alter alternative incarceration program in Torrington, Connecticut. Um, look them up online, check them out. Uh, it's, it is a wonderful program. Uh, we've used it three times and um, couldn't, can't say enough good things about it. Uh, it, it teaches skills to people. Um, it gives them um, uh, a community to work with and, and, uh, it, and, and, they're, and it's a joy. Yeah. So um, I highly recommend that. And here's another picture of volunteers hard at work, uh, children, seniors, families, enjoying a sunny day in the garden. So I thought, <laughs> I thought I'd tell you a, a few stories uh, this evening. Um, children are always uh, a, a wonderful to have in the garden because everything's a miracle to them. But what I've been discovering this year, uh, actually the past couple of years, is um, that miracles, uh, discovering miracles in the garden are, it's not just for, um, for children, but for all of us. Um, we had a surge of, um, of people moving uh, from the city uh, to Litchfield County um, uh, during COVID, and many of them moving here full time. Um, and some of them never having lived in the country and never having gardened. Uh, so it's a lot of fun to teach seniors how to garden. Um, this is a picture of potatoes in our garden. Um, it was part of our adopt a crop uh, program. Uh, we call this part of the garden, the garden of feed -in. And we have teams, as I mentioned, and, and um, I headed up the potato team uh, this particular year. And um, I was going away on vacation and uh, met, ran into one of my a team members in the garden and asked him if he would please check the potato plants for me while I was away because I thought maybe they needed to be harvested 
before I got back. So he asked me to show him the potatoes. And so I did. I took him back to the potatoes and he looked and he seemed puzzled. And um, he asked me, well, how do I know when they're ready? And I uh, said, well, they'll start to turn yellow and uh, begin to droop a little bit and uh, you can just sort of check it out and see if there's anything there. And he said, well, where are they? <laughs> so I knelt down in the soil and he joined me and I didn't have a shovel, so I stuck my hand in the soil and, and rooted around and pulled out one of these beautiful Yukon golds. <laughs> and I thought the man was going to fall over. He was so surprised and almost speechless. And I said, go ahead, you can, <laughs> you can do this too. And the next thing I knew, he was rooting around in the soil himself and pulling out as many tomatoes as he could find with a huge smile on his face and he was absolutely delighted. Um, this man had never gardened before and um, had recently moved to Goshen, Connecticut and was having lots of fun in the garden. That's one of my senior stories. Um, I mentioned earlier that it's not, um, sometimes you have problems in the garden, uh, angry neighbors and negligent gardeners often the two are related. So you get complaints from the gardeners that the garden next to them is full of weeds and the weeds are producing seeds and um, the plot is neglected and um, mildew is growing all over their tomato plants and so gardeners can get very, very upset. A well-organized garden with a strong leadership team and committed members can overcome these obstacles. It's sometimes difficult. The best thing to do is have your gardeners sign an agreement that they will abide by the rules and regulations. In our garden, we call it courtesy in the garden. And I'm going to give you a, uh, a sample of what these rules might look like. Whoop, here we go. Um, this is in the first person. Um, and, oh, thank you. My husband's helping me see the screen because I can't see it. Mm. Well, anyway, um, decide, as I mentioned earlier, decide if you're going to um, charge a fee for use of the garden. Um, and um, uh, you can ask for that fee when this form is signed, uh, unless you have a, um, a, a agreement uh, or an application that you use for your um, garden, uh, you can include this. Um, so um, this, I think this top line says um, that, that I will, um, hmm. What does that say? Oh, my fee will be refunded to me when I clean up my plot at the end of the season. You can do that. Um, I think it would be complicated. Uh, we don't do that, um, but we do require the gardeners to clean up their plots at the end of the season. Doesn't always happen. Um, I will have something planted in my garden by the date um, given and keep it planted all summer. This doesn't always happen either. Uh, one year we had a garden plot sit there for over a month after the garden opened. And, um, and uh, I called the person who had signed up and paid for the plot. And she said to me, oh, well, um, my daughter's um, planting the garden. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll give the daughter a call. So I gave the daughter a call and she said, Oh, my mother's planting the garden. <laughs> well, the garden was never planted um, and uh, someone else uh, took over the garden and planted for the garden to feed in. So um, it's good to give a date when the, uh, you require the garden to be planted by. If I must abandon my plot for any reason, I will notify the manager uh, and accept responsibility to leave it as it was found. 
That doesn't happen all the time either. Um, sometimes you have to go in there and just cover the uh, plot with cardboard, but the person should know that that plot, they have lost that plot for the following year. Uh, I will keep the weeds down and pain, maintain the areas immediately surrounding my plot. If my plot becomes unkempt, I understand I will be given two weeks notice to clean it up. And at that time, it will be reassigned or tilled in. I will keep trash and litter clean from the plot as well as from adjacent pathways and fences. And I will participate in the fall cleanup of the garden. I will plant tall crops where they, where they will not shade neighboring garden plots. Um, also, um, if you have fencing around your garden, it's a good idea to um, uh, uh, have a rule that uh, does not allow people to use your fencing as a lattice. Um, it can damage the fence and it can shade other people's gardens. Uh, I will pick only my own crops unless given permission by the plot user. We're very strict about this. Uh, it's it's hard when you see um, tomatoes uh, uh, ripe and falling on the ground and rotting and string beans going to seed and not being picked and all that food uh, wasted. Um, gardeners uh, often will ask, can I go into so-and-so's plot and pick uh, those vegetables that are going to waste? We don't allow that. Um, what we do is we call the gardener and say, um, did you realize and would you like to donate it to the food pantry? Um, best not to give um, permission to um, take food from other people's plots. I will, uh, if you're going organic, I will not use fertilizer, and insecticides or weed repellents that will anyway affect other plots. Uh, we don't allow, uh, um, we don't allow, uh, non-organic fertilizers um, in the garden and um, we don't allow, allow any chemicals in our garden um, so you might want to decide, decide on that and include it in your rules and regulations. Um, another good idea is I agree to volunteer so many hours towards the community gardening efforts. Lots of things need to be done uh, in and around the community garden. Someone has to clean out the shed once in a while Maybe you have um, grass in your plots that needs, that needs to be mowed. Maybe you need weed whacking done around your fence. Maybe someone needs to uh, turn the compost pile. So um, this is a very good idea. I will not bring pets into the garden. Um, dogs and cats can be very disruptive uh, to the garden and, and some people um, are not uh, uh, animal lovers. So. Uh, probably best to keep pets out of the garden. I understand that neither the garden group nor the owners of the land are responsible for my actions. Um, we talked about this, a uh, release of liability. Therefore, I agree to hold harmless the garden group and the owners of the land for any liability, damage, loss, or claim that occurs in connection with my use of the garden by me or any of my guests. Um, signed and dated, plot number. Definitely, um, let's see, here we go. Sorry about that. Oh, going the wrong way. Well, here's a good review. Hope you read very quickly. Okay, there's grandma in the garden. <laughs> this was a number of years ago. I think her grandchild is now 10 years old at this time. Her, she was waiting for the grandchild to be gone, a, a born um, any minute and um, talked about it a lot to all of us. Um, and we were excited for her. It was the first grandchild. I um, was in the grocery, local grocery store and I saw her at the other end of the aisle and she saw me. We connected and she started running towards me, holding out her cell phone. And I thought the baby came. And as she came closer, <laughs> she said to me, look at my kale. 
<laughs> and there was a picture of the kale in her garden. She was a first year gardener and boy, was she excited. Um, I think she was as excited, if not more, when her granddaughter was born. But um, I wouldn't tell her granddaughter that. But anyway, um, she was pretty excited um, about um, growing things in the garden. And she's become, over the past eight years, she's become a, a real um, treasure. She uh, teaches other people the garden. So what are the other things you can do in the garden? Um, we give a series of workshops, um, workshops on uh, planting growing from seed. We usually do that in uh, April indoors because we're not out in the garden yet. Uh, we do composting workshops. Um, that is uh, really essential if you're going to have uh, compost bins on your property because on your garden because um, uh, lots of bad things can happen <laughs> in compost bins. Um, you might be find yourself pulling out plastic, lots of plastic bags and things that don't belong there. So workshops on composting. Um, we've had uh, workshops on soil. Uh, many, many other topics. So uh, have a place uh, where your gardeners can be comfortable, maybe a place in the shade, uh, some place to sit and, um, and, and provide these opportunities. Uh, celebrations, um, Earth Day celebrations in the garden, uh, worship in the garden. Um, gardens can be uh, a place uh, just to meet and, and have a meal together. Potluck gatherings with food from the garden. Beautiful. Music and celebrations in the garden. You can see our compost bin in the right hand picture. We use, uh, we throw lots of uh, uh, shredded paper in there. Uh, so if you have documents that, that you're shredding at home, bring them to the compost bin loves carbon. Um, newspaper, shredded newspaper, lots of cardboard. Two-thirds brown, which is mostly paper, and uh, one-third green. Other events in the garden. Uh, work days. Uh, these are days that we invite all the gardeners, and uh, often we invite the scouts to come over and help us. Um, the youth group at our church, um, and we provide some refreshments for them. Open garden days. This is something that happens in our community. Uh, people open up their gardens on a particular um, day in the summer, usually in August. So we open the community garden, and we have greeters, and we have tours of the garden. Um, it's wonderful for the community. People get ideas. They learn that you're there. They sign up to volunteer. Um, they learn about gardening. Uh, it's it's um, I, I highly recommend open garden days. If your community doesn't do it, your garden can do it. And as I said, create a shady meeting area in the garden and spend some time there. Great to have benches in the garden, especially if you have a lot of seniors in your garden like we do. And here's Charles. Charles joined us last year, Reti recently retired, spent his whole life in New York City, knew nothing about gardening, had never done it. And um, he was um, a little hesitant at first. Um, we gave him lots of coaching. Um, he developed some self-confidence, um, made lots of friends and um, was <laughs> smiling a lot. Uh, every time they came to the garden and saw things growing. So um, uh, one day he came up to me with this squash, this big Hubbard squash, and said, Lynn, I don't know what to do with this. I looked at it and said, I have no idea what to do with it. And then I thought about it, and um, the Goshen Agricultural Society has um, a fair every year and people enter vegetables. So I said, well, Charles, why don't you go over to the Agricultural Society and, you know, and fill out an application and enter your squash. And lo and behold, he won first prize. So 
Charles has asked for two plots this coming year and can't wait till the garden season starts. So that is my presentation. Um, I want to give um, thanks uh, to um, all the people who have um, participated uh, with IREJN in growing community gardens around the state of Connecticut, especially Letty Nagels, Charmaine Craig, Jah uh, Jamila Muhammad, and Virginia Army, who have dug in and are creating community gardens and teaching about community gardens. Thank you so much. And to all of those out there who are guiding and teaching us how to be a community in the garden. We thank you for your interest and we're thrilled that you're here and we hope that we can support you in your efforts. Please don't hesitate to contact us and um, we will hold your hand through the process. Um, again, specifics for how to garden, um, go to IREJN and uh, to this web, uh, website that you see on the screen, you can take a picture of it or Terry will put it up on our, on our website. The garden is to feed not just the body, but the soul. Not just the body, but the soul. It's soul food. <laughs> <laughs> and it's miracle. <laughs> In my tradition, when we finish worship, we say we have a common commission. So I have taken that our common commission and I've reworded it a little bit to, um, to suit uh, uh, the garden. So I thought maybe we could say this together. Let us now go forth into the garden in peace, being of good spirit, holding fast to hoe and spade, bringing new life from soil, strengthening our bodies while supporting our communities, helping the hungry, honoring all people, plants, and creatures, and loving and serving our God and rejoicing in the miracle of life on this planet. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lynn, that was great. I mean, so much goes into planning a community garden. Uh, and I, I mean, until I saw your presentation, I, it was great how, how much you covered the nuts and bolts because that is what will really help a community garden get um, solidified and be successful in the future. So Millie, did you have, do you have follow-up questions? Do you want us to sort of look at the Q and A? Um, the only thing I wanted to follow up on was the um, benefits to emotional health. When you think of being in the garden, we have so much um, talk nowadays of isolation, particularly after COVID mm -hmm. and children um, sort of on their cell phones and videos. And there's something about getting in the garden in the quietness or sometimes not so quiet, but there's something very healing about the garden. And I think that's something that really needs to be emphasized that it's not just food, but it's that wonderful feeling of calm that you get when you are in the garden. I, could, I couldn't agree more with Millie. Um, when COVID first started, our um, garden committee got together and said, <laughs> on Zoom, I should say, uh, and said, do we open the garden this year? And we said, yeah, absolutely we open the garden this year. And it was one of our best years in the garden mm -hmm. because people were so excited to be there and to be with other people. And it was so healing for us. So yes, in so many ways, the garden's healing. Just witnessing the miracles in the garden. Um, it's you know, it's funny, I want to follow up on that is anytime I'm giving a talk and I could be talking about legislative advocacy or, you know, fossil fuel pollution, something that doesn't have anything to do, obviously, with gardening. But when people ask me, you know, what are the top three things I should do? My my third one, the one I always close with is plant something, <laughs> whether it's a pollinator garden 
or a veggie garden or a tree, once you get out there and plant something, it'll actually make you feel better because that's something I think that is needs to be recognized a little bit more or um, is that the environmental work can be very hard. It can be discouraging. And so, but when you're working with the land and growing something and watching it come to life, it's, it's, it is healing. So, but anyway, yeah. So I'm glad that Millie, I'm glad you highlighted that. And on, on that same um, topic, it's anytime you plant a garden, you benefit the environment because that compost pile is absorbing carbon from the air. Mm -hmm. and that um, green space is now not becoming a heat sink like anything that's paved over. Mm -hmm. So those little things that you're doing really add up. Imagine if that mm -hmm. were done by many, many people. I mean, it really could have an effect. Mm -hmm. So I have one question. I have a question in the question and uh, answer from RD who said, are there any insurance uh, issues involved? I think uh, we'll get into some of that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Liability insurance, yeah. yes. Um, so um, sometimes the landowner will uh, include it under uh, their um, liability insurance. Um, if not, then you have to go to your organization. If it's not on your site, uh, if it's on another site, you have to go to your uh, organization's uh, insurance company and see if they can extend it. Um, in our case, um, our, uh, our garden is a project of the church. And so because it's a project of the church, our liability insurance covers it. Is it mm. on church property? It's not our property. Okay. No, it's not our property. It's usually a rider on an insurance policy yes. and it'll, it's not that expensive. It could be, I don't know, a hundred dollars or something. And mm -hmm. you would just add that to your cost in your budget mm -hmm. uh, for the uh, creating the garden. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to have uh, your gardeners uh, sign a release of liability too, as well. Uh, our garden is uh, at, at the, uh, the church in Goshen is located at the Goshen Agricultural Society uh, on their land. Um, and they required us to have the garden sign the release of liability. Um, so Brenda wanted to know, will this agreement be available to us as a reference? And yes, it will be. And then you got a lot of compliments uh, from people who love the revised common commission. Um, and uh, Sabina said, you have a valuable wealth of information. Thank you for being a resource. Janet uh, Hooper said, thank you so much, Lynn. Love the final commission. She said, I think the other important concept is the necessity of a core organizational group, many hands, et cetera. Also the plot size might uh, be discussed. Yes, okay. Um, uh, a uh, uh, hundred square feet or 200 square feet um, seem to work well for individual plots. So um, uh, that would be a 10 by 20 or a 10 by 10. Um, in our Garden of Feden, uh, we have five plots. They're all uh, 10 by 20. So we have a thousand square feet of, um, of uh, growing space. And we generally grow, uh, Janet Hooper can correct me on this because she's the one who keeps track of it all, <laughs> uh, anywhere between 500 uh, to uh, 700. I, I think one year we raised 900 pounds of food. Um, I just want to say that the Judea Garden, uh, and that was the um, Adopt-A-Crop Garden, uh, they've been in existence uh, for, um, let me see. They've been in existence for, I think, 10 years, 13 years. Over 13 years, they have grown 40,000 pounds of food. Can you imagine? 40,000 pounds. Oh, pounds. my goodness. I think that's incredible. And they, um, oh, so, um, you know, going back to what uh, Millie said about um, how community gardens make us feel good, feel better. Uh, I want to say that um, um, you don't. You, we have we have a, a woman who is not able to work in the garden, 
uh, but she wants to be part of the garden. So she comes about once a week and she picks up the vegetables <laughs> and she delivers them to the food pantry. And um, it's an it's a opportunity for her to get out, be in the community and see a smiling face at the food pantry. And it, it helps her so much. She's actually not gardening, but she's participating. So there are, look for ways in which people can participate that when they can't, when, they, when they're physically not able to garden. Could do a lot of good. They could also order seeds when the seed catalogs come out, if they want to do something like that. Or start seed in their home. Actually, I've, I've been doing that. I started mine in January. This is a, oh. little, <laughs> a lavender plant oh. from seed. So hopefully by August, it'll look like something. Oh, that's awesome. But I have um, one of the, the, the kits with all the lights, you know, the grow lights downstairs in my basement. So I grow our lettuces. Nice. Do we have any more Q, uh, questions? Uh, yeah, there are a couple in the Q&A. Um, Brian wanted to know, what's the, he wants to know, what's the best ob objection against the creation of a community garden? He said, just as a way to get a sense of the best arguments when I proposed this to my parish. So he wants to know, like, what is the most, you know, what, hmm. what, what objections is he likely to come up against? I... If I may answer, I worked at a community garden in an inner city and people were afraid that it would be a place where people hang out. Um, so they were nervous about not it not being populated by gardeners, but by someone else that they may not have wanted. Hmm. That, that was not a locked garden. That was just open to the public and they could come in and pick whatever they wanted to or participate. So mm -hmm. I would say mm -hmm. that, was one, that was a one issue. I, um, I haven't uh, actually come up with any resistance. Um, I did have one man um, who was very upset that we were bringing uh, uh, the alternative incarceration program uh -huh. to the town. And, um, and so I asked him if he would, um, I told him when they were going to be there and I asked him if he would go over and supervise. <laughs> and they were there for three days. And the next time I saw him at church, he came walking over to me and I thought, uh oh. Um, <laughs> and he said, Lynn, he said, that was one of the best things I've ever done. So he, awesome. couldn't, he couldn't say enough good things. I, I haven't found any resistance uh, at all to community gardens. Um, I, I, I helped start two in an urban area uh, when we moved to Goshen and our pastor, um, uh, I guess my reputation followed me, um, asked if I would start one in Goshen, which is a, you know, it's an agricultural, it, it has a history of being an agricultural community. I thought, well, what do they need a community garden for here? And so the pastor said, well, let's put it to the uh, congregation and let them vote on it. So the next Sunday, she did. <laughs> Everyone raised their hand. So, you know, um, there was no objection at all. So I don't, Interesting. Think you'll have any, any, I don't think you'll have any pushback. I wouldn't worry about it. So Diane said, this was wonderful. She loved the way Lynn presented the steps and Millie's input. She said, during COVID, I found my community garden plot an inspirational place to recharge with community. Her question is about how much does a typical raised bed cost, you know, typical size, height, et cetera. And she also said, please also include the Connecticut Deep for both pollution sources and garden grant opportunities. So mm -hmm. I'll say probably the grant opportunities will have to get out to folks a little later. I don't know if Lynn has them all on hand. Right. Um, however, uh, typical raised bed cost, what do you think? Well, it depends on what you're using. Um, if, you, you, if you're using scrap lum, lumber, um, it, and, and it's, uh, you can pick it up at your local um, recycling center, it doesn't have to cost you anything. Um, there are people who um, make raised beds without uh, 
any structure. They just pile the soil up. So um, that's another um, way of doing it. I did see a, a woman make her raised bed with uh, leftover vinyl siding. Hmm. Not sure about that because I'm not sure if um, if there's any leaching of uh, vinyl into the soil. So I, okay. I would check on that. Do most people use cedar for a raised bed? It, it lasts longer. Yeah. So and how how much? I mean, I know cedar is very fairly expensive. expensive at this point. I, I'm thinking that if you did a, a four by eight bed out of cedar, you'd probably be about uh, two hundred dollars, something like that. It's really it gets it gets pricey in in lumber. Um, and if you order it from one of these garden centers, it's crazy expensive. So you really have to build beds yourself. You need to get a couple of carpenters on your committee. And and about um, bringing a soil, you know, filling in soil. How how much how much does that cost? I know, Millie, you talked about organic yeah. soil um, in the bags and whatnot. You use a lot of soil. I know. You can, you know, um, I I have gotten a truckload of soil that was organic and a mixture of compost soil and some sand, and it was about three hundred dollars. Okay, uh, Lynn, does that make sense to you? I don't have any experience with that, so I really can't say. Okay. Um, and how much, Millie? How big was? How much space did that? Truckload fill? Not that much. Oh, really? <laughs> um, mm -hmm. A truckload of soil would probably be adequate for, I would say, a typical community garden. But if you're using it in your yard, you know, if you have a, we have big gardens here, um, it it doesn't go that far. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you can also price soil at a place like um, Costco, where they have the big, really big bags of organic soil. Um, and it's the cheapest I've found it at about $12, I think, a bag. Um, that may be worth it, but you'd probably use about eight of those bags for, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a big planter. Uh, look around your community, too, to see if... Um you know, maybe a garden center would be willing to give you a discount because you're a community garden. Uh, okay. We have a local farmer who has uh, cows and he, uh, he creates a lot of compost. And every year he brings us a couple truckloads of it and he just gives it to us because we're doing something for the community and he realizes that. Um, also, I wanna say, um, now that I think of it, uh, in, in our shed, we have a scale and uh, <clears throat> we weigh all the food that we give away. Mm -hmm. And then we publish an annual report. We haven't done it the past couple of years. We have to get back to that. Um, we, we print out an annual report so the community can see what we're actually doing. Mm -hmm. um, so make sure your community knows what you're doing and how you're serving. And um, you might find benefactors in your community who would who would help um, pay for some of that? So um, I would. Look I have to that. say, especially if you're if you're looking for funding, uh, a scale I think is a very worthwhile investment for a community garden because people do like you know funders and donors like to see measurable results and being able to say we Absolutely. donated X pounds of produce yeah. Yeah. It yeah. goes a long, long way. Uh -huh. Yeah, it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And keeping track of how many volunteers you have from the community too. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. So we have another question. Where did you get the pallets for your compost? Oh, <laughs> um, I would try um, places like, um, uh, I, I, I don't know who got them. Someone just showed up with them one day. Um, but um, I would try places like Blue Seal, Agway, um, maybe Ace Hardware, hardware stores. They get things delivered on pallets and then um, they uh, might have pallets available uh, that they would give you. Um, 
also at the same places, if you're using cardboard and we use cardboard a lot for mulching, um, you can get the, um, the pallets come with cardboard on them. Uh, and they, they um, try to, they like to recycle the cardboard. So I go to those places and uh, regularly and pick up cardboard and it doesn't have any tape on it. You don't have to open up boxes. I've also done dumpster diving when I've been desperate for cardboard. <laughs> Gotten pretty good at that too. But, um, uh, um, and I, that's something I didn't cover in my talk because it's actually about gardening. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, you're creating pathways and the soil scientist that I talked to, he said, make sure those pathways are covered. So you, if you have anything in the soil that's toxic, it's not aerialized. So we use cardboard in all of our pathways and we cover it with bark mulch. Um, uh, you know, you can also have grass growing in your pathways, but then you have to mow it, you know, regularly. Mm -hmm. So, um, but cardboard also is good for the soil because um, the life in the soil uh, feeds on it. So if you, um, and it's a, it's a fun thing to so, show kids to lift up a piece of cardboard that's been there a while and you see all the little critters underneath, uh, the, all the worms eating it and, um, and producing mm. and creating all your soil, you know? So uh, that's why we put cardboard and, and shredded paper and shredded newspaper in our compost pile too. So cardboard's good for the soil. A lot of people don't realize that. Newspaper, uh, mulch your gardens with newspaper, um, also a source of car uh, carbon. Uh, most newspapers are printed with soy ink, so you don't have to worry about toxins. Anyway, cool. a little bit too long about that. No, that's great. <laughs> that's great, that's great. Um, are there any other questions? A lot of compliments. <laughs> Any other questions, guys? It's a lot to oh. absorb. Let's see here. Alicia just said, I just priced my four by eight and one four by eight by one and a half raised bed with old castle concrete corners for $120. You can save money on soil by putting sawdust or wood chips and a little manure for added nitrogen on the lower levels. Garden soil is about $50 a cubic yard. And I think a truck is like eight cubic yards, something like that, so. Yeah, that sounds about right, for sure. Alicia, where are you from? I live out in Preston and I feel like garden soil is a little bit cheaper than that, but I also haven't gotten it and I didn't, didn't need it last year. I had it left over. I had gotten like so, I mean, so much of it. it I had this hill. So <laughs> I kept chipping away at it. Now I'm out. Now I need more if I'm going to do that route. So um, cool. Wow, that's great. Any other questions from the folks? Let's see here. It's great. I'm anxious to get gardening now after all this. No, yes. Janet has a great, um, Janet Hooper, I'm gonna allow you to talk. Oh. You've got your hand raised. Oh, well, I only had my hand raised because the only way I could get into this, my chat was disabled. For some oh. Um, I was, maybe that speaks to something. Lynn would <laughs> understand that joke, my chat being disabled. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was just going to clarify a few things. One year we did um, actually uh, half a ton of food was made in our four or five little uh, Garden of Eden thing. That was an unusual year. Usually it's less. So that was one thing. The fellow that asked what pushback can you get? One is your budget. And if the church or the organization, says, oh my gosh, we can't, you know, fences are expensive, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, there are grants in our part of the world, the Taconic Foundation, which is in, you know, southwestern Massachusetts helped us. So if you're up in our part of the world, northwestern Connecticut, Taconic Foundation, there's also a couple of grant givers in Maine that we utilized. Um, oh. Again, we got about a thousand bucks from each one of those. That was just enough for us to oh. kickstart what we were doing. Let's see, what else did I go on and on about? <clears throat> Lynn mentioned the fact that we have gotten compost, manure, 
wood chips from local people for free. Uh, and again, that's the nature of whatever the community you're in to, to, uh, to figure that out. Um, the other thing would be criteria in terms of what pushback, you know, who's going to get a garden? Is that horrible man down the street that we all don't like, is he going to get a garden? You know, I'm being facetious, but, um, and so you, you, in your group, as you get organized, you need to set up how you're going to, you know, first come first serve. Is everyone going to have a small plot, a big plot? Are they going to be only church members? They're going to be, if that, you know, whatever. So that's another thing to throw into the mix as you're um, working towards your, towards your goal. And that's the end of me. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Thank you, Janet. Um, Thanks to everybody. Yeah, uh, and and I, I and I want to say uh, that um, our garden, though it's sponsored by a church, it's open to everybody in the community. We do have priorities to church members, but then it's open to the general community, and it's a great place to get to know your neighbors. <laughs> That's um, great. Yeah. So. And we have. Uh, apparently, so Sarah said Lynn's church is offering a seed starting workshop. If you want to promote that, Lynn. Yes, that's on um, uh, March 15th, I believe. It, that's a Saturday. It's March 15th at 10 a.m. at the Church of Christ on the Rotary in Goshen on uh, corner on the intersection of Route 4 and Route 63. Uh, you can look it up, Church of Christ in Goshen. Cool. And, and that's being given by uh, uh, Elaine Z Zulo is also joining. No, Sarah's saying it's March 25th. About the 15th. Oh, March 25th. Thank you, Sarah. So John, uh, which is um, John or Nancy, wanted to know, does a composter attract pests? It can. <laughs> it can. But if you turn it over, if you kind of bury what you throw in there, maybe um, turn it over and get some leaves on top of it, it's not as likely to attract as much. Mm -hmm. The birds pick at it. The raccoons pick at it, the squirrels, everybody goes in there. Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, I do, I have a compost pile and I do attract lots of fauna, but they're hungry too. Yeah, we, we have, um, we have frequent visitors to our compost bins as well, but I, I agree with Melly. if you cover it over, uh, have a pile of leaves handy. Um, when somebody makes a contribution, we actually have um, we have a, a compost bin at our church. So uh, before you go into the church door, you can you can make a charitable contribution to our compost bin. Uh, That's but, awesome. <laughs> composting is so cool. It is. It is. It really is. It's such a great way to uh, reduce the waste in our waste stream and create great soil at the same time. Yeah. Let's see here. So, so don't so, throw the shredding, shredded paper from your. Oh, geez. So Phoebe said, how do I get Lynn to North Carolina to take charge of a condo community garden that has rules, but no enforcement? <laughs> oh, Lynn, you got to take it on the road now. You, you know who Phoebe is. She's my daughter. <laughs> no way. <laughs> I've been oh, it's so her. funny. <laughs> We've had many enforcing. conversations about those those people down in North Carolina don't pay any attention to rules. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. <laughs> that's hilarious. All right, does anyone else have any questions? Any of others, Lynn's other children? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to thank you so much. Um, this has been great. It's, I mean, it's a, it's such a core important piece of building a community garden. I hope that we're going to be able to follow this up with one that's sort of the next steps on, you know, planting and blah, blah, blah. But this is really key and having a successful, successful community garden really is about laying the foundation for success. I actually, the thing that jumped out at me was making sure you had a three-year lease. You know, I can't imagine putting this much work into it and then having to find a new space. So this has been really, uh, I think, a critically important um, uh, workshop. Um, and so I wanna thank Lynn and Millie for uh, 
Lynn for presenting and Millie for moderating and adding her wisdom as well. Mm -hmm. I also want to invite everyone to the IREVN Earthkeeper Dinner. It's our annual fundraising dinner. It will be Thursday, April 27th this year at the Pond House Cafe. Tickets are available on our website, IREJN.org. Our winner of the Jack Spaith Earthkeeper Award is Leticia Colon de Mejias, who is being recognized for her incredible work in climate justice and energy justice. So it's a wonderful night. Uh, vegan, vegetarian options of food is fantastic. The, it's just a great night to network with like-minded environmental um, advocates. So I hope you will join us. And this, I will follow up with links that Lynn has provided, um, and uh, the, this presentation will be on YouTube on our channel, so you can watch it again if you like. And I also can put Lynn's presentation into a PDF and share that on our website as well. So you'll have all that information, including the sample um, guidelines and rules, which I think are really important. So. Mm -hmm. Well, thank, thank you, you everybody and Millie and and thank you Jan Hooper. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right guys. Thank you so much. Thank have you. have an awesome evening. And I will see you guys later. Let me turn the recording Good off. Good night everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>